Abdullah al Barakatu. Honorable guests, ministers, officials, ulama, brothers and sisters, I am honored to introduce our esteemed guest speaker today, the Deputy Minister of Basic Education in South Africa, Mr. Muhammad Enver Surti. Mr. Surti holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Westville, attained in 1973, an Honours degree in Philosophy in 1974, a prop degree from the University of South Africa, which is UNISA, in 1977. He also completed an LLM degree in constitutional litigation from the University of the Western Cape in 1996 and postgraduate certificate in higher education. Mr. Surti was admitted as an attorney in 1977 and practiced as an attorney and human rights lawyer in Rustenburg from 1977 until 1994. He became a Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development of the Republic of South Africa from 25th September 2008 to 10th May 2009. He also served as a Member of Parliament in the Senate and its successor, the National Council of Provinces from 1994 until 2004. He was a Member of the Management Committee of the Constitutional Assembly and negotiator for the ANC on the Bill of Rights for the period 1994 to 1996. He joined the National Assembly and was redeployed to the NCOP as Chief Wop from 1999 to 2004 and served as Deputy Minister of Education of the Republic of South Africa before the split from 29 April 2004 until 25 September 2008. His topic today is why Muslims should vote ANC. I now call on Mr. N. Masurti for his talk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma ayin ala zikrta wa shukrika wa bismillah ibadatik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let me at the outset extend a, my sincere gratitude to the trustees of the mosque for the invitation of the extended to me. And it is a singular privilege uh, to be addressing you today. It is not the first time that I've been to this masjid. I have on many occasions in the past before my Jum'ah Jum Salah over here, and I have on, on previous occasions been invited to speak, but because of the nature of my work, I was unable to do so. I imagine the timing is, is, is appropriate. We are indeed uh, having an election, which is very, very imminent. And the topic that I've been requested to address you on is as to why Muslims, so why, why I, as a Muslim, would uh, vote for the African National Congress. Now, South Africa is a very interesting country. It is very, very diverse. It is multilingual, it is multicultural, it is multiracial. As I stand here in front of you, I am of Gujarati speaking origin. My mother tongue is, is Gujarati. I'm a Muslim. I'm a black in terms of our political definition. I'm also a citizen of South Africa. And, 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 and the coat of arms of our country reflects this diversity. It's, it's, it's about unity in diversity. I'm proud to be a Muslim in South Africa, given the constitutional values that so many of our forebears. Thank you very much. I hope. Am I audible at the back? We, many of us, especially us who are more older, are aware of the institution of apartheid. We separated us as a people. We are aware of the fact that how we were in the past treated as unequal citizens and how as a result of the huge sacrifice and the struggle of many of us, we were able to achieve our democracy and our freedom. Now, it didn't come by accident. It is the result of huge sacrifices that our people have made, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, in the struggle for our freedom and equality. I was 
privilege to have served the African National Congress in its capacity as a member of parliament and also as a negotiator, negotiator of the Bill of Rights. And being a Muslim, uh, I certainly can celebrate the fact that our democracy has brought to us three important things which underpins our constitution. One is the achievement of equality, two is the affirmation of our dignity, and third is our freedom. I would like to take you back to more than 1400 years ago when our Holy Prophet Muhammad in Arabia sought to achieve this kind of freedom. The Muslims were being oppressed, the Muslims were sought, were divided, there was inequality between Arab and non-Arab, and within the Arabs themselves, as different tribes. And one of his purposes, in addition to, and it's certainly the most important and preeminent purpose of his struggle, was to affirm the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it was also to unite the Ummah, <laughs> to ensure that all tribes are brought together, and Allah says in the Holy Quran that he's created you in different tribes and nations so that you might understand and know each other rather than despise each other. So one of the singular purposes of the message was to create this unity of purpose and unity across borders. The second was also to ensure that the struggle of the Holy Prophet ﷺ was not a struggle confined to Medina or to Mecca as the case might be, but a struggle for this kind of freedom and this kind of affirmation of the dignity of people across the globe. So the Muslim in Medina and Mecca stood as a Muslim in solidarity with other Muslims anywhere else in the country. And this indeed was the reason why Islam was able to spread so rapidly across the globe because it broke down the barriers of race, it broke down the barriers of tribe, it broke down the barriers of, 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 of class. It said that people would be judged according to their, 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 their piety and their righteousness rather than according to the class or according to their race. Now, I am not even going to suggest that we have, we are anywhere near the, the, the status and the stature of, of, of the Prophet and his companions. But we can say that as an African National Congress and as a leadership within the ANC, we have drawn inspiration from the life of the Holy Prophet. Think about when he entered Madina, Makkah when he conquered, as it were, Mecca, and he had every opportunity to be punitive, to seek vengeance, because indeed he and the Muslims were oppressed. Yet he chose to forgive. Without an edict of law, he says, I'm entering Mecca, and I have pardoned, I have forgiven all the people, even my oppressors. Now, if we think about this particularly incredible quality of the Holy Prophet then we can understand what kind of magnanimity and character he might have had, which we all embrace. So this world today celebrates the wonderful magnanimity and, and, and certainly the generosity of spirit of Nelson Mandela, the late mayor of Nelson Mandela, who sought forgiveness and nation building. But if we look behind the example, the model of that particular exercise was found amongst Muslims more than 1400 years ago. And it is as Muslims we should celebrate that. Now, I can only share with you my own life experiences. As a person who has made an insignificant contribution to the politics of this country, who is committed to the creation of a non-racial, non-sexist, democratic society. I can share with you with the reality that in the 20 years that I've served as a member of parliament in various offices, I have never ever, and I say that in the mosque as I'm standing out here, come across an organization that is more committed to non-racialism. As, as, as a South African citizen of Indian origin, at no single occasion was my authority as a member of parliament, as a chief whip, as a minister, questioned by any of my African colleagues on the basis of race. I was Comrade Ember. I was an equal, I was no different, because we, both, we all embraced the same value and the same purpose, the creation of a non-racial, non-sexist democratic society. For those who are older, you will certainly recollect and remember 
That as Indians, we had no choice. You've heard my curriculum vitae, the CV being read to say, studied BA at the University of Durban Westville, did his honors at the University of Durban Westville. Yes, indeed, we did study there because we could go to no other place. As Indians, we couldn't go to the University of Pakistan unless we had ministerial consent or the University of Cape Town or any other institution of higher learning. So our parents were compelled to ensure that as, as Indians, we were obliged to go to an institution that was dedicated to Indians. The same applied to our schools, the same applied to our places of worship, the same applied to our businesses, and the same applied to our residential areas. So our freedom of movement was restricted, our freedom to learn and to study at an institution of our choice was restricted. Our freedoms were completely taken away from us. And indeed, our dignity was violated as a people. In 1994, we, of, the learn, of the total population of students in the institutions of higher learning, 150,000 was black. And when I say black, I refer to Africans, Indians, and colors. 750,000 were whites. 20 years thereafter, we can celebrate the fact that 850,000 of our students in institutions of higher learning are black. And when I say black, I talk about African, Indian, and colored. And that more than 73% of those students in institutions of higher learning are being funded by the state. Now, as Muslims, we do know and we have to accept and recognize the fact that the starting point of our social life has to be the empathy, the solidarity that we have with the poorest of the poor. I can take pride in the fact, and I've asked this question more than once, can anybody in the audience tell, think and raise their hands if they know how many children in our schools are being fed every day? Some would say a million, some would say two million, some would say 200,000. 9.2 million children are being fed every single day by this government. Eight out of 10 children go to, to no fee schools without having to pay a cent in fees. And of those 20% that do pay fees, if at all they are unable to do so, the law exempts them from paying fees. So in effect, what we are providing is free basic education. 8.2 billion rands has been set aside for bursaries for those who go to tertiary institutions. Now this is remarkable in the context of the fact that just in 1994, only 200,000 rands were set aside for bursaries. Only 200,000 rands were set aside for bursaries. And this is where we moved in a short space of time. I do not think, and I'm not going to pretend, that we do not have challenges. We have challenges in relation to corruption. We have challenges in relation to good governance. We have challenges in relation to efficient governance. But the reality is, but this organization, the African National Congress, which is the ruling party, has indeed provided more than 3.2 million houses to our people, free of charge. The reality is that in 1995, we had 15,000 schools without water and electricity. We speak in 2014, we have less than 1,000. It should be none, because it is indeed a violation of our dignity. You know, people talk about the fact that there are inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the system, and indeed there are inefficiencies in the system from time to time. But I want you to reflect on your life when you were in grade one. Remember you had a faint line book, exercise book, a pencil, a sharpener, and an eraser. Today every child that's in grade R, grade one, grade two, grade three, and up to grade nine, but in the foundation phase, received eight books, workbooks. One for literacy, one for numeracy, one for English as a first additional language, and one on life skills. Four in the first half of the year, four in the second half of the year, and whether the child is African, Indian, colored, or white does not matter. Whether the child is a quintile five school, a quintile three school, quintile two school, or a quintile one school. That means that we have delivered, just in the past three years, more than 154 million books to ensure that we are able to enhance and improve the literacy and the numeracy. In 1994, our pass rate was less than 50%. Today, we can celebrate the fact that more than 78% of our learners have passed the trip. And one out of three children can go to university. And one out of three children can, to go, can go to a, a university of technology. 
and one of, out of three children can go to a university, uh, to an FET college. Now, what has happened in a short space of time that there has been a quantitative change and a qualitative change in what we are able to deliver to our people? And I'm not suggesting at all that we have achieved the level of excellence that we should, but certainly we have to recognize the fact that we are moving away from mediocrity. That is the reality that we see around us. You know, people have suggested in the past, and indeed it was a reality, that most of your distinctions come from those schools that were former Model C schools. You couldn't have four and you couldn't have five schools. Today, the distinctions, more distinctions are being produced by Kuntal's one, two, and three, the poorest schools, than Kuntal four and five schools. More than 65,000 distinctions in matric have come from those schools. Now, we have a huge challenge. And given the legacy of our past, we have to recognize the fact that we have to do much more. And we cannot do it alone as an organization or as a government. And that is why we have made education a societal issue. We recognize that we have serious challenges in relation to, to, to education. But then we tend to have short memories. I remember in 1966, I was in what was then called Standard 6. We were class of 32 in the Rustenburg High School. I moved over to Lenz. When I matriculated in 1970, I was the only one of a class of 32 that matriculated without fail. Yet in the next generation, in the generation of my children, they pass. All of them pass. So it took a generation to change the character and the content and the, the, the competency of an education environment. Not three years, not four years, an entire generation. And indeed, as I look at my children, I take pride and share in, the, in, 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 in their, and celebrate their achievements. And I know that the future of my grandchildren will certainly be better than that of my grandchildren. I don't have a watch and I just want to be guided by somebody who will not have to guide me from time to time. Now, I'm giving a perspective of education because I serve as a Deputy Minister of Education. The elements that I would speak about and celebrate are the fact that opportunities that were hitherto denied to the Indian community, to the African community, and the Kalk community, and are open to them. That there is indeed a transformation in government, whether you look at the national government, the provincial government, or your, your local government. But if you look at the list of the African National Congress, for example, you would find that all racial groups are represented. And quite interestingly, they are not represented by manipulation. They are represented because they have been elected to those positions by more than a thousand branches of the African National Congress. So the African National Congress and its memberships recognizes that you cannot build a nation and a society by being exclusively African or exclusively Indian or exclusively white, but you have to have representation of everybody else. So if you look at the list of the top 100, for example, of the African National Congress, and again, it is not as a result of manipulation, it is as a result of election, you would have at least nine Indians in that list. That says a lot about an organization, given the fact that there, there, there are millions of members who could make different choices. It means that they recognize the contribution of comrades and colleagues on the basis of their competency and efficiency, and not on the basis of their race. Compare that list to the list of any other political party, including the DA, and you will have a different story. We don't have to look at the future of what the DA is doing. Look at the current practice of the DA in the Western Cape, for example. How many women are there in that list? Hardly any, besides Aaron Zilla. How many Africans are there? None, if I'm not mistaken, maybe one or two colors. So it's a male organization. Now we have empowered our women in the African National Congress. We have about best representation in at least every second name on the list of an African National Congress is that of a woman. Now, no other organization has been so purposeful in terms of what it seeks to achieve. And that is the reality that we have to accept. So I vote for the African National Congress because it is committed to non-racialism, because it is inclusive, because it has affirmed the dignity of our people, whether we talk about health care, whether we talk about education, because it admits and recognizes that it has challenges, that it has not achieved 
what it ought to achieve, but indeed it has delivered, that it has made a difference in the life of our people. It is not by accident that more than 15 million people, including our orphans, our poorer people, our, our elderly people and this, the disabled, are the recipients of, uh, of grants. It's quite an incredible contribution that any government can make. And if you look at change within government across the world, in the past, you would discover that no other government has produced so much and delivered so much in a period of 20 years as this government has done. Now, I must perhaps as a round off say to you, and I commence by saying that when the Prophet brought the message of Islam, he didn't bring it for the Arabs only. He brought it for the entire Ummah. And as Muslims, we are obliged to recognize our responsibility to others who are oppressed, others who are Muslim, others who are disadvantaged. Let's look at the Palestinian struggle. At no stage in its entire history has the African National Congress wavered in its commitment to the Palestinian cause. In every single conference of the African National Congress, there is a resolution in solidarity with the Palestinians. There is a South African Zionist group that has just published a pamphlet which speaks about the friends of Israel. Who are the friends? The ACDP, the DA. And who are its not, they say, no friend, the African National Congress. Because the African National Congress has stood firm with the Palestinians in their cause for the struggle for freedom and liberation. Now, are we going to forget that? Are we going to forget who the funders of the DA are? Are we going to forget about the apartheid war? I was in Parliament at the time, we debated the matter. And in fact, by some accident, at that time, because I was the chief work, the DA had supported the debate. And the person that had supported it was in serious trouble as a result of that. Now, I think we must open our eyes and reflect on where we were, where we are right now, and re recognize the fact that as Muslims, and I give you the good example of uh, our MEC for transport, Ismail Bari, very pious, very righteous, wears the beard with pride, wears his kurta, is able to go to parliament, has been able to go to parliament without any difficulty. And be recognized as a member of parliament who is Muslim, and be unashamed about his identity. Try that in France, in terms of your attire or in terms of any symbol, religious symbol that you, can, that you have to carry. Look at the Islamophobia that takes place across the world, and then you begin to realize that, look, we are indeed lucky. Which Muslim can say that he or she is victimized in this country because of the faith that he or she has attached to? We're in a country where we are a minority as Muslims, and yet, the recognition of the rights of a Muslim exists. There are occasions, as a Minister of Education, or as Deputy Minister of Education, where I'm, where I'm contacted to say, in this particular school, they are not allowing a learner to wear a beard, grow a beard. We make the intervention, correct it immediately, and that child is able to do so. There are instances where our children say, this particular principal who doesn't understand the Constitution and its underlying values is preventing our children from wearing a pants, a long pants. We make the intervention, it is corrected. This occurs only in this country. And it occurs like this, quite natural and spontaneous and organic. And I think for that alone, we should indeed be proud. We should be proud in the fact that we are in a country where there is religious tolerance. Where as a Muslim, I can go into a church, I can go into a temple, I can go into a synagogue and speak to our people. I think that is the kind of future that I would want our children to grow up with. To say, be proud of your identity as a Muslim, no question about it, and be tolerant and respectful of the identity of all other religious groups. So that is the kind of diverse and united society we create. I thank the Almighty for giving us the opportunity for being able to participate in and being part of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful nation that we created 20 years ago. Not as a result of my endeavors or effort, but the result of many people who have laid down their lives, others who were in exile, others who were incarcerated. I think we owe it to them to say that we are not going to give up hope. We owe it to them to say that where the ANC is, we must stand up, make our voices heard, and correct 
because we do learn from time to time. And you have a responsibility to ensure that you guide us and correct us. But I can give you the assurance that in terms of what I've raised over here, and I say that in the mosque on Juma, I have absolutely, absolutely no reservation that I have still to come across an organization within my religious group or otherwise that is so committed to non-racialism, that is so committed to non-sexism, and is so committed to democracy. Those values are very, very difficult to find in this difficult and complex world of ours, and I think we should celebrate it. I can only urge you, I cannot compel you to say, think very, very carefully, make your vote. I certainly am going to vote for the African National Congress, and I do hope that many of you would basically make the considered decision to do so likewise. Just think about how difficult, especially those elders who have gone through the past, the difficult path that we've lived over there, whose dignities have been violated all the time, to say that that past means nothing. Things have changed. It doesn't matter what, what, what has occurred in the past. We don't have any responsibility to think and reflect on the wonderful choices that we have as a nation. So please, uh, brothers and sisters, 7th of May is the elections. You have to vote. Vote for the party that you feel within your heart best represents your interests as a Muslim and as a citizen in South Africa. And when I say Muslim, I talk about not an Indian Muslim, I do not talk about a colored Muslim, a white Muslim, an African Muslim, I talk about a Muslim who is committed to the affirmation of the dignity of all our people, to the eradication of poverty, and to the creation of a better and united society. Jazakum Allah khairi for your attention. We thank the African National Cong Congress for accepting our invitation and Deputy Minister Mohammed Enver Surti for taking time out of his busy schedule to come out and speak here today. This talk will be on Radio 1584 at 4 p.m. today and will also be on YouTube tomorrow. The channel on YouTube there is IIS of SK. Lastly, we at the Institute for Islamic Services are carrying out Operation Winter Warmth for 2014. We have started distributions in Pretoria and we still need your support. We are distributing blankets, clothing, turn foods, etc. A blanket costs 47 Rand each. You may drop off at 330 Carmen Street in Lorium or call us on 012-374-1584. Inshallah, we will also be coming around to collect. Jazakallah.